in time putting all my lessons together, and when I do, I come up with this, like this. I go by this as it's manuscripted out. There's a reason for that. If I teach or I preach on certain topics, if I teach or preach on certain topics and I don't have this manuscript in front of me, I tend to go on rabbit trails. So this keeps me on the trail. So, secondly, I want to tell you that I am putting this material together just as I have presented it, and I am putting them in books just like this. This is volume three because I've already gone through one and two with you. This I'm going to be placing in the library, and all of you will have access to every lesson that we have taught on Revelation. So if there's a lesson that you'd like to go back and restudy, it will be in the library, and you are free to copy it on the uh, copy machine, make as many copies as you wish. It is not copyrighted. Uh, the only thing I copyright, copyright is books, and uh, I've just finished my second book, and it's in the process right now of finishing editing. I think we've finally got past that. And we are now ready to uh, get it published, hopefully, hopefully pretty soon. Um, I do copyright my books, but I don't copyright any of my lessons. So if, uh, if there's something in there that you think you could use, you're welcome to it. So I thought I needed to throw that out there for you and let you know that all of this material is available to you. Also, I am putting all together, I haven't gotten it all finished yet. I'm putting together all the lessons I did on the Beatitudes, and I'll be doing the same thing with those. So if you'd like to go back and study those. All right. Uh, as we begin this morning, uh, to begin with, are there any special prayer requests that we need to bring up before the Lord before we get started? Yes, ma'am. Susan Little. Susan Little. Hmm. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Steve Rome. Oh. Leukemia. Okay. Well, let's go to our Father in prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you so much for all you do for us. We thank you, Father, for this phenomenal privilege of coming to you in prayer and bringing before you the things that are a concern of our hearts and especially the people that we're concerned for and about. Father, we bring before you this morning Susan Little and the struggle she's having with her, her health and the medication she's seeking that will work, and we pray, Father, that that will happen. We ask you, Father, to be with Steve Rome and his family as he's been diagnosed with leukemia. Father, we pray that, that uh, through this you will give comfort and strength. We pray, Father, that you be with us this morning as we continue this fascinating story that you have given to us and an assurance that regardless of what happens in this world, you are our God. And that, Father, we are so thankful. And we ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, did I hit the wrong button or something here? The PowerPoint. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Now I want to continue as we as we continue this study. We need to understand that what we're witnessing here is a progression 
a progression regarding the destruction of something called Babylon. That is a code word that John used to indicate he was actually talking about Rome. Uh, It began in chapter 14, this destruction process. And in chapter 14, what we saw in verse 8 of chapter 14 is that a second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Again, in chapter 16, when we see the seven bowls of God's wrath being poured out upon her, we read this announcement in verse 19 of that chapter. It says, The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. And now in chapter 17 through chapter 19, we're going to now get a full explanation and understanding that the church of the early church had that there will be much rejoicing among the faithful when Babylon is finally meeting her downfall. Now, the amount of space devoted to telling this about her downfall, I believe, signifies to the early church the importance of this event. Think about it for a moment. You're living in a government that is constantly attacking you, killing you, trying to wipe you out. She's being used as an instrument from Satan himself to actually try to destroy the church. And you finally read of her destruction, what are you going to do? Are you going to hold a funeral? Are you going to rejoice that Satan has been defeated? We rejoice. And so the main purpose of chapter 17 is not so much to identify the Caesar who is on the throne uh, when the book was written or to give the early church a twist on the fact that Nero is going to be brought back to life because there was a myth going around that Nero had died and yet he comes back to life to reign again. The purpose of this section, and by the way, that there's something in this chapter that something indicates, well, what's going on here? The purpose of this section was to inform the church that Rome was headed for a destruction. And The message that was clear to the early church should be very clear to the church today, and the message is simply this. All opposition to the Lord will ultimately be put down. All opposition against the Lord will eventually come to an end. And so we read in this chapter of a great harlot. And so what I want to do is we read about the great harlot. Turn with me to chapter 17 of Revelation. And I'm hoping that all of you read this chapter before you came to class this morning. Um, Let's begin with verse 1. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters, With her, the kings of the earth have committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with a blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, and she was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with the abomination abominable things, and the filth of her adulteries. The title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, Mother of Prostitutes and of the Abominations of the Earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman with 
<clears throat> and of the beast she rides, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and will come out of the abyss and go into his destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whom names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because he once was, now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. Now the angel said, I'm going to tell you what this is about. And then he gives a hint. This woman is sitting on seven hills. Now what he's talking about here is Satan's tool of deception. That's really what this particular chapter is about. And what it's about is this is Satan's third ally in trying to wipe out the church. The first ally, if you remember, was the beast that came out of the sea, the sea of humanity. And this represented power and intimidation and emperor worship. The emperor demanded that you worship me as Lord. The second was the false prophet. And the false prophet was nothing more than lies and deception. And this one is where Satan tries to deceive people. And the third one, the third one now, he describes as a harlot. And this is Rome. And this is the seductive uh, nature of Rome and what she had to offer. And why this is important is because if the first two fail to work, if intimidation and false teaching doesn't get you, then here is one that Satan may use. And that is to go straight to the emotion of a person. Use their emotions. And so she tries to seduce and here is where Satan most often succeeds. The seductive nature of wealth, power, esteem, position, riches, so seductive and is so easily accepted as God's blessings when I have those things. See the seductive nature? And it's there. And so what is very important is we understand the implication of John using the word harlot to describe her. Now what should immediately come to the mind of a Christian when the word harlot is used is something that is said in chapter 21 verse 9 of Revelation. Look at what it says. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. What is the church, What of the many things that describe the church in the Bible, she is the body of Christ. The, she is called the church of God, the church of Christ, the church of the firstborn. She's also called the bride of Christ. Now, what is going on here is the, the angel is going to show John, the early church, and us how far Satan will go in his attempt to destroy God's people. Now, I'm not going to do this this morning. I will do this next week. But next week, what we're going to do is look at a little bit of church history. We're going to have to understand a little bit of church history to really understand what is being revealed in chapter 17. Because it is something that Satan is going to use over and over and over again. And he's going to show us just how far he used Rome 
to deceive almost everyone on this planet into thinking that as long as you have some form of religion, you're okay. That's the deception of Rome. And I'm going to forewarn you now. If you show up next week, prepare to become uneasy. Because what I'm going to show you next week on what this, uh, how this applies to every generation, it will show you how easy it is to be sidetracked into false religion. And it's happening, it happened to Rome. So we need to keep this in context. Satan had used intimidation. It didn't work. He did not destroy the church through intimidation, did he? Because we're still here, folks. He used false prophets in the early church. Did it work? Nope, church still here. So he's going to use false religion. And I've got to tell you this. It is, and I think history proves me to be right, on the day of judgment we will see more people lost because of false religion than persecution. More people will be lost and forever doomed to a place called Gehenna, translated in English, hell. There will be more people there because of false religion than because of persecution. You see, here's something Satan discovered. The more he persecuted the church, the stronger she got, and the more she spread the word. So he had to back off. He said, that's backfiring on me. That's making them stronger. So I will do something else. I will create, if the church of Jesus Christ is called the pure bride of Christ, then in Scripture, how would you describe a false church? One who would be seductive to invite you in to believe things were okay when they're not. It would be called a harlot. All right. We're going to look at the great harlot, and this is going to be the seat of Satan's power. And I want to share something with you. How do you know that, Jack? What did he say? He said, the woman is sitting on seven hills and has seven heads. Now, this indicates power. Now, look at verses 9 to 11 with me. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain only for a little while. The beast who once was and is not and is in the eighth king, he belongs to the seventh and is going to his destruction. In other words, Rome hadn't reached that point yet when John wrote this, but it's getting there and it's going to get there at a particular time in history. And so he says further in verse 18, the woman you saw is the great city that rules on the, uh, over the kings of the earth. Now, here are two real big hints of who he's talking about. Who is this beast? Let me share a few quotes from the early church writers concerning what they said this was talking about. We learn, for example, from Tertullian. Written, uh, written about the year 300. So again, Babylon, in the writings of our own John, is a figure of the city of Rome, for she is equally great and proud of her influence. That's out of the Ananicene Fathers, book number 3, page 162. Here is another one. This one. For we see from our brother John the great overthrow of Babylon, that is the Roman state. This is victorious 
about the uh, year 280, Anna and I have seen Father, volume 7, page 352. I could quote a whole lot more early church writers who said this whole thing was about Rome. But one thing they all agreed on, Rome was going to fall because it was prophesied in Revelation. That was going to be her punishment from God for what she had done. Now, why did God wait so long to do it? Why does he wait right now? Why is he waiting right now? Well, we're told God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should repent, right? God gave them time to repent, but they didn't. And so what we're talking about here is the end of Roman rule. The language of verse 8 through 18 can be confusing. We read it a while ago about the seven heads and the ten, or seven horns and all of that. There's some possible explanations about that. And one is they're talking about seven different governments. He said, Five are fallen. Well, let's look at that. If that's true, let's look at the main powers of government that have preceded Rome. The first one was Egypt. Then there was Assyria. And then later, we had the Babylonians, or Babylon. After then, we had the Medo-Persians. Then we had Greece. And then, number six is Rome. Rome was the sixth of those. He said the other was not yet to come, and it would be an eighth. I will give you a hint. Immediately after Rome fell, did it come back alive? Yes. Not as a great power, but did it come back alive? Something happened. Rome fell about 584. That's when she finally and totally collapsed. In the year 606, okay, you go from 584 to 606, something happened. And in the year 606, she comes back alive in power, but not the same power. She was transformed. The transformation, by the way, started about the year 150. And something happened in 150 in the church. And that progressed and progressed and progressed. And then in the year 325, a man came into power, Constantine. Up until the year 325, the church was enemy of the state. Constantine professed to be a Christian, and he made Christianity the law of the state. But he had a hard time convincing the church. So what do you do to convince the people in the pews that Rome is now your friend? You start putting the church leaders in places of power. And you rename their positions. Instead of governors and lieutenant governors and mayors, you have your priest, you have your bishops, you have your archbishops, and then eventually in 606 A.D., you have the first pope. First time in history a man was called pope. His name was Boniface III. In the year 606, he comes into power with all of his church leaders who have taken the place of the mayors, governors, Lieutenant governors, they're all in power and they're all in place. We're going to look at a little bit more of that next week. 
But it really explains something to me. When John saw this this harlot, he was amazed. He couldn't believe it. What has happened to the church? I think that was what he was amazed at. Yeah, Rome's going to fall, but Satan's not going to stop. I'm going to give you a lot more about that next week. You really, if you want to know about that, how it happened, it will hopefully open our eyes about some things because this is where it happened. All anti-Christian governments and religions of the future came from here. Notice she was called the mother of all harlots. Notice that? Did you notice that? When John saw that, he said she was a harlot and she was called the mother of all harlots. If you know your church history, where did denominational come from? Brethren, if it hadn't been for the Catholic Church, there would be no denominations. I rest my case. We'll get into that next week. Here's another approach. Maybe he was talking about Caesars. He said five are fallen. Well, let's look. We first one we have is not the Roman Catholic Church, excuse me. The first one is Octavius. All right, Octavia, or Augustus, excuse me, he reigned from 27 to 14, 27 B.C. to 14 A.D. The next one was Tiberius. He reigned from 14 to 37. And then there was Gatius. Uh, he, he reigned from 37 to 41. And then after him was Claudius, who reigned from 41 to 54. And then Nero comes along in 54 to 68. And he said, five have fallen. Well, it would have been those five if he's talking about Nero's or Caesar's. He says one is. Well, if that's true, that would have been Vespasian. Here's the problem. Here's, here's an interesting thing about it. Remember, he was the one that said, no longer am I, am I going to wait until I'm dead that you call me Lord. I'm going to have that now. You call me Lord now while I'm alive. So it fits in that maybe that's who he was actually talking about. So one is. So maybe that was the one he was talking about. He says, and the next one is yet to come, which would have been, in this case, which would have been Titus. Titus ruled from 79 to 81. Now, he only ruled for a short while. And then he said there is an eighth. And the eighth would have been a dimension. He reigned from 81 to 96. He was a lot like Titus. It says he will be like the one before him. In fact, he was. The list did not start, if you notice, with Julius Caesar. And there's a lot of debate as to whether or not he was actually a Caesar or not. An emperor. We don't, there, the history's not that clear on that. But there were also some, some that they had ignored. For example, here's some Caesars. Uh, that uh, uh, are some emperors, if you will, that reigned only for a short time. There was Galba, Ortho, and Vitalius. Uh, and so they followed one another in very quick succession between 68 and 69. And the reason is because of uprisings and assassinations. I mean, it would just, in that one short period, there were three of them that were on the throne just for a short while, and they were gone. Don't let us miss the point in trying to figure all this out. It's not what the beast does, and it's not about her power. The main, the main message here is she is going to eventually be punished. Church, listen to this message and believe it. No power on the face of this earth 
can overcome what God did and cannot sidestep or cause God to sidestep his plan. Do not let the events of governments, the events of people, or the presence of evil ever take away your joy in the Lord. That's the message. Why? Because they're not going to win. They're not going to win. And the, 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 the deception is, when it looks like they are, people start to think there is no God or He doesn't care. That's part of Satan's strategy to get us to believe that or think that. Let me tell you something, folks. There is nothing that Satan and all of his demons can do, and there are no tools available to him in this world or universe that can undo what Jesus has done both in the cross and in his resurrection. There is no power on earth that can undo that. There's no power in the spiritual realm that can undo that. There is no power in all of heaven that can undo that. And so when you were baptized into Jesus Christ, you were transformed into the kingdom of God by that same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That is why we read later on in Revelation chapter 20 in verses 6, or 4 through 6, he said, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. Now, who are these people? Let's read on. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the Word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image or had not received its mark on their forehead and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. What's the thousand years? We would get to chapter 20. We'll clarify that, but that's basically the gospel age until the complete, completeness of time. And he says, and this is the first resurrection. Now listen clear, closely. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years till the completeness, to the end, to always. Don't let the impact of what we just read escape you. Those who have participated in the first resurrection that indicates there must be two resurrections in well there's a time coming when all those in their grave are going to hear his voice and all are going to come out that must be the second one well when was the first one let's see what brother paul had to say that in romans chapter 6 he says if you have been baptized into christ you have been what? Raised with Christ. You know what that means? In Texas terms, you ain't going to die. When you came out of that grave, that watery grave that you experienced, you participated in the first resurrection, and he says a second death has no power over you. And I think what he's trying to say to the early church that's receiving this letter, don't forget that. Don't forget it. Yes, Rome is after you. Yes, the enemy is using Rome. Yes, the enemy is using false prophets. He's using all kinds of things to try to get your eyes off the goal. And in doing so, you will stop living like you believe that you've been resurrected. 
Live like it. Don't be deceived. So in what we're trying to say, I believe, in chapter 17, is let us never forget God's promise. From the very beginning, God has always used Satan's tools against Satan for the purpose of bringing about God's own plan and the de defeat of Satan. Now, let me ask you a question. Has God ever done that in history? I want you to ask, I want to ask you a question. How do you suppose Satan reacted when Jesus breathed his last breath on the cross? How do you think Satan and all of the demons behaved? I believe they rejoiced. I believe they thought they had actually won and had done what he'd been trying to do ever since Genesis chapter 3, and that is to defeat God's plan. However, how do you suppose after Jesus died on the cross, and Satan is having his big party like he's won. How do you suppose he reacted when Jesus walked out of that grave and breathed, uh, or breathed his first breath on that third day? Do you suppose Satan felt he may have blown it? The very thing Satan introduced, which was death, God allowed him to use to bring forth life. And so I think it's interesting. On the day of Pentecost, when the first gospel sermon is preached after the resurrection of Christ, what does Peter say in his sermon? Listen carefully. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for, God, for death to keep its hold on him." It was God's plan all along, Satan. And you were a pawn and you thought you were a king. God just allowed your own ignorance of his plan to backfire on you and defeat your own pride. In other words, God let you have enough rope to hang yourself, Satan. And that's what you did. And now because of the evil Satan had brought against Jesus, those people at Pentecost have now heard that he's resurrected. And it was God's plan. And now there is salvation available. And these people ask a question. Since he's been resurrected, they ask the question, what must we do? And what did Peter tell them? Repent and experience your resurrection through baptism. The death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus is what's going to bring you salvation. The very thing Satan tried to stop was the very tool God used to bring about the destruction of Satan's power. Isn't that just like God? That's called the wisdom of God, by the way. And so the, for the first time, listen carefully, for the first time since the fall in the garden, man once again has forgiveness of sin because in the eyes of God now there is no sin and how did that happen God let Satan outsmart himself to bring it about 
And so 3,000 were baptized that day, and I wonder how Satan responded every time one came out of the water. I wonder if he was thinking, it was because of my foolish pride that these people are being saved, and God knew it all along. Now, he doesn't respond with repentance. He responds with anger. And now he is going to use Babylon, the lure of Babylon. Often evil looks invincible. But let me tell you, it's eventually going to fall. We may, we may not be sure about everything in this chapter. We're going to look at a whole lot more next week. But we can be sure about this. Brethren, God is going to punish evil. Never forget what our brother John said in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its despair, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Let me tell you, folks, we have already won. Don't forget that. We didn't win because of our resourcefulness, we didn't win because of our righteousness. We won because of His. During the Middle Ages, there was, a, it was during the Inquisition time, there was an instrument of torture called the Virgin. Let me tell you about this, because it is exactly what Babylon is, the lure, if you will, of Babylon, the seduction of Babylon. It had the form of a beautiful woman dressed in gorgeous robes. It had an inviting smile on its face, and it had outstretched arms, and the victim was pushed into the arms in order to kiss this virgin. But then her arms would fold around the victim with a deadly embrace, and a hundred hidden knives would pierce the victim. Let me tell you something. Babylon puts on a beautiful face. And she invites the people to enjoy her forbidden pleasures. But the end, however, is death. Just like that instrument of torture. And when Babylon, when Babylon beckons, remember the message of Jesus. And the message of Revelation, flee, flee, do not participate, no matter how seductive it may be. Thank you. Uh, once again, if you would read Re Revelation 17 again for next Sunday, we're going to go in a whole lot more detail than we did today. I really felt I had to do this one first in order to do what we're going to do next week. Thank you so much.